And so the, if you hang a little further uh, left turn there, uh, James, we'll see a stand. And on that stand is sort of the heart of our systems down here. It is uh, an Ondera Data Instruments logger, uh, and it also has up on top of it, you'll see a little red head current meter on top. Yep, and uh, as you drop down, all of our oxygen optodes report to that uh, blue cylinder there that has the guts and the loggers in it, and that we translate that data, transmit that data back to the habitat and also out live. So if you have our codes, you can actually watch the data live. Any monitoring activities that go on in the future are going to are going to involve cabled instruments of that sort that allow you to watch them real time. It's great fun. If we switch back to James. Uh, one last instrument or two, and he moves to his left a little bit more. You'll see a uh, current measurement. But let's give, uh, there's an acoustic Doppler velocimeter uh, to his, on the right side of the screen, the vertical instrument with a little tripod-looking thing at the base of it. We use acoustic signals to determine the rate at which organisms are pumping water on the reef. And if you go to the left from there, James, a little bit more left, you'll see our aquadop sensors, uh, the little heads on the left that have the little triple sensor heads are actually capable of measuring current velocities and directions as you go up from the seafloor into the water column. Uh, a little further to the left is an, uh, an ADCP, an acoustic Doppler current profiler instrument. There we go with four heads. So we had 17 instruments out cabled on this mission, and because of the expertise here at Aquarius Reef Space, uh, the life support buoy that functions very well, we were able to keep them all alive for the entire mission. And as I mentioned earlier, the string opto system has been out since April. We're just delighted to be able to work here. So I'll stop there, Saul, and throw it back to you. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. Thank you for that introduction. We've had a few questions come in via the, the chat, and I wanted to pass them to you. One comes from Jan, a marine biology student from Pensacola. And I'll ask her question and then maybe expand it a little bit. Um, the, the first question is, what is the goal of, the, of this acidification uh, study? And maybe if I can expand that a bit, you know, what, what are the long-term objectives of this type of research, and how might that play on policymakers and others um, who deal with marine resources? Let me start out by saying that the uh, oceanographic community was a little bit asleep at the wheel uh, until about 10 years ago when the uh, ocean acidification problem reared its head. We hadn't been paying enough attention to it. Uh, we were mostly focused on atmospheric CO2 increases. Suddenly, measurements came in that indicated the pH in the oceans was dropping. And in fact, in the last couple of decades, it dropped by about 0.1 units in pH, which doesn't sound like a lot, but which in re reality translates into 10% of the carbonate that calcifying organisms need to make calcium carbonate, in the case of a reef the mineral aragonite. Uh, so one of the objectives became, how is this global effect uh, going to impact coral reef ecosystems made of this uh, extremely soluble aragonite material? Well, if you want to answer that question, you also have to deal with local acidification effects. Namely, we also have lots of organisms in coastal waters, shallow waters, that are breathing, therefore emitting CO2, just like we do. We breathe oxygen. We take some out of the air, we breathe in, we emit CO2 into it and pump that out. So do the sponges out on this reef, for example. So our main objective is to distinguish the local acidification effects from the global CO2 increase effect, a very subtle long-term effect that we're going to have to have really good monitoring to deal with. If you're a reef manager, you're going to want to be able to distinguish between local acidification and global acidification impact. So I'll, I'll stop there for the moment and see if that's answered the question. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. A, a related uh, question which you were starting to lead into was how long will this study last? And maybe, you know, that's a direct question about this specific project, but also addresses the larger question of your research in this type of area and how that progresses from here. Yes, there's a number of uh, research groups around the country and around the world that are trying to set out systems that are capable of monitoring for periods of much longer than months. Our initial experiment here began in April of last year, 2010, with our optode oxygen measurement systems uh, and some field tests of the SEAS-2 instrument capable of the very, very high quality uh, pH measurements. 
This year, we put our, our systems out for measuring long-term oxygen changes, and we added in some new pH instrumentation that we hope is going to be good for much longer periods of time. Uh, so the uh, yellow banded and blue banded uh, Satlantic instruments that I mentioned to you, serials number two and three, those are our hopes for uh, long-term measurements. They're off to the right there in the picture that's being projected from James' helmet, actually right in the center, uh, hanging near the Opto's yellow banded gear, uh, if, you, if we take a look again. So those instruments are actually among the first in the world that are capable of sustained measurements in the coastal ocean without uh, continuous care or monitoring of some sort. I will say also that the uh, mass spectrometer that's off on the right side of the picture is capable of very high quality CO2 or CO2 dissolved in water measurements. Uh, and down below it is the SEAS instrument that we're just referring to. Uh, the, that's basically an underwater auto-analyzer for pH. So in answering your question, I think it's safe to say that we're now capable of monitoring pH and oxygen and other parameters that are important for controlling pH on a time scale of weeks to months. The goal, of course, is to be able to do it for years. We're going to need to have observatories that have power and comms capabilities. We're also going to have to have access, ocean access, for people that are able to go work on those instruments. So we, that's why we're here. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. The next question comes from Spencer, a marine biology student from North Carolina, and it really ties into where you decided to go. And, and his specific question is, why can't you do this study using scuba from the surface? But perhaps I can expand that into something you've touched on a few times, but the question of how Aquarius and Aquarius Reef Base and the infrastructure as well as the um, saturation diving method itself uh, lend themselves to, this to the research you're undertaking. Well, the, we do both types. We do surface diving. We call those day boat operations here. But when we want to do highly uh, detailed experiments in which we're really looking to distinguish uh, processes on the seafloor with multiple instruments, those instruments take hours to set up, if not days. They have to be maintained carefully. Uh, it's very useful to be able to be out on the reef eight to nine hours a day. We have four divers down here, and we use every minute of that dive time that we have. Uh, we have divided into two buddy teams. We're out for out at 7 a.m. in the morning or earlier, and out on the reef on television, we can stay out typically 9 p.m. So it's the ocean access that really matters. The instruments require that level of effort. Secondly, if you want to be able to explore spatially and to make measurements on scales that are relevant, and understanding the processes we're working on, it really helps to be able to pick up the sensor, move it to the next spot, get replicate data sent from that spot. Surface diving simply doesn't give us enough time. We also don't consider it very safe, up and down, up and down, up and down, as compared to saturating and staying down on the seafloor. Uh, your ears are not subjected to all that stress. The pressure differentials are much less. So saturation diving is a real blessing for us. I hope that answers the question. That's great. Thank you, Chris. Um, at this stage, I'd like to see if Libby, who is on the phone, um, has any additional questions for Chris at this time. I actually do. Uh, one, I have a couple of questions. One is, why aren't we seeing more corals around the Aquarius reef space? And the second is, um, how can you distinguish atmospheric CO2 from the benthically respired CO2? Those are excellent questions, Libby. Let me start off with the first one. Uh, we've just, in recent years, it's become apparent that uh, coral cover on reefs, in fact, and sometimes in very remote areas around the world, has decreased from something over 50% to something less than 20% on average, and in some highly impacted reefs, less than 10% cover, as you're seeing here. We refer to these reefs as degraded reefs. One of the key questions, of course, is why is this occurring? I grew up down here, and uh, when I was a child here, there were branching corals all over the place. In the late 70s, we lost those. We're continuing to see diseases impact corals. Uh, how to distinguish the effects of temperature, uh, ocean acidification, 
uh, diseases, all the other processes, too many nutrients in the water column. That's the, all those are part of the, the questions that are being asked right here at Conk Reef. Uh, it's a good place to ask those questions because of the ability to make sustained measurements over a long time period. So there's a wealth of data from this reef. Uh, there's going to be major efforts in the coming decades to establish other monitoring stations, I'm sure. I've lost track of your second question there. Libby, could you repeat that one a little bit? Oh, how to distinguish yeah, so uh, atmospheric from... Go ahead. Right. No, I think you got it. <laughs> okay, yes, I, I remember. How do you distinguish CO2, carbon dioxide, that's coming from the atmosphere versus CO2 that's coming from the seafloor? Well, there are basically two ways that we're attempting to use to do that. One is we're measuring vertical gradients in the concentrations of these gases. Uh, as you get down next to the seafloor, and you're seeing a picture of the seafloor now, uh, as you get down next to the benthos organisms that live in the seafloor, you begin to see an increase in concentration. And if you're able to measure the vertical velocities of the water, that is the mixing that's going on, you can actually establish what the net transport of CO2 off the seafloor into the water column is. So my colleague Niels Lindquist has teamed up with uh, Jim Hench and Joanna Rossman, who are fluid dynamics scientists at UNC Luke uh, University, and uh, are, they're doing a lot of uh, measurements to try to distinguish that. And if we measure CO2 along with that, that we are able to actually see what the net uh, transport into the water column is. So that's one answer. Now we're looking at uh, the uh, gear down on the seafloor that we've gathered together in our final intercalibration experiment. I'll explain that in a minute. But if you look off to the mass spectrometer with the white handle there in the distance, the reason that we have this instrument out here, which is worth something like a half million dollars, fortunately we're friends with a monitor instruments company and the president, Tony Brewer, uh, the instrument is actually capable not only of measuring the concentration of gases, but also their stable isotope composition. Your body is made of about 99% carbon-12 and 1% carbon-13. Uh, the ratio of those to one another tells you something about the source. If you're enriched in carbon-13, if you're uh, depleted in carbon-13, so we're actually using the mass spectrometer to look at the source on the basis of its carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratio, we hope. It's a real challenge to make these instruments work at that level, but uh, we think we're getting that caliber of data right now. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. Um, this is Saul again. We have one more question before we wrap this up, and this question comes from Joni at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and her question is, are you able to distinguish how different communities affect the pH? That's, a, that's another terrific question. I'll simply uh, start by saying we're combining general measurements of vertical gradients up above the seafloor, like I just described, with point source measurements, where we actually swim around with the CFET instruments that you saw in the picture, the ones with the yellow uh, band on them and the blue band on them. Field Inquist, uh, my uh, co-PI in this effort, is leading that part of the expedition, and he has made over 110 measurements of pH from individual sponges, for example. So if we go to individual sponges, we can actually make a, a point source measurement. Uh, so yes, that's an excellent question, and we're attempting uh, both procedures. James is making his way up to our candidate barrel sponge next to our intercalibration experiment, and he's going to inject some harmless fluorescein dye around the outside of the sponge Think of the sponge as a hollow tree stump, and he's going to put the dye outside the bark, and you're going to see what the sponge is, uh, is capable of doing. There goes the dye in the lower left of your picture, and let's watch in the center, uh, the hollow part of the tree stump. This is a big barrel sponge. That's a sponge in Amoeba, and you're going to see some dye being pumped up through the heart of the sponge. There it comes. We're going to let uh, James get into position, let that little fish run away. And we're going to see the dye. It'll take about five or ten seconds, and then it'll begin to flow up through the sponge at about ten centimeters per second. So if we take one of our pH measurement systems and put it right in the, into the flow, we can actually distinguish. There comes the dye out of the sponge right now. 
And let's let's uh, let's just uh, watch that flow up for a minute. Thank you very much, James. That's working great. Just to keep that picture going. And look at how fast this sponge is pumping dye. It's capable of actually pumping this dye well up into the water column. And if you swim through the water column, you're going to see low oxygen concentrations when you go through the plume, because again, the sponge is an animal and breathes just like us. So I hope that answers the question. We go right to the critters we're interested in and measure their effects directly. Okay, thank you, Chris. That's really wonderful. At this stage, we need to wrap up this event as the science team is uh, anxiously waiting to get back out onto the reef and continue with their research. Today is um, day seven of our mission. We have, uh, excuse me, day eight of our mission. We have uh, decompression starting tomorrow, and the science team has lots of work to do to get the mission activities wrapped up. Before signing off, uh, a few things you'd like to note. First, the habitat is supported by NOAA, and it's here for the use of the greater marine science community. We are really an asset nationally and internationally for marine scientists from various institutions to come and work with and conduct uh, research uh, at Mount Reef. So the extraordinary bottom time, the years of historical data, about 20 years here at Concrete, and the substantial subsea infrastructure, including network uh, capabilities, power capabilities, um, both to the, to the habitat and to the life support buoy, buoy uh, make Aquarius uniquely suited for marine science research. So we really welcome inquiries from scientists around the country and the world for ways they can work with us and projects undertake at Aquarius in the future. People looking for more information, um, please visit our website at uncw.edu slash Aquarius, and hopefully Dom, our uh, production uh, technician, will get that up for us in a moment. And if you go to uncw.edu slash Aquarius, uh, the point of contact for science inquiries will be our director, Tom Potts. So this is the end of our scheduled event. If there are more questions, um, we encourage you to continue the conversation and to continue to interact with our scientists and with Aquarius Reef Base as we continue further missions. We also have chats and um, ways to ask questions to Aquanaut on our home page. So please join us there. We'll continue with diving activities tonight. Um, and of course the scientists will be out finishing their last dives tomorrow morning. At this stage, I'd like to wrap up, up this event. We'll keep the broadcast going for the next 10 or 15 minutes as we bring our diver James back into the habitat and stage him in. So at this time, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us and ask James to start making his way back to the habitat. And James, if you could come back to the habitat and give us a brief tour of the outside of the habitat and some of the infrastructure in place for people's information. Um, this is a bit of an aside from the science theme of today's broadcast, but good information for people. And again, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we'll be signing off except for the dive operation at this time. Okay.